Hello, it's Jack Tudor here from Attention Magazine. Welcome to Crucial Listening, the podcast where I speak to musicians and sound artists about three albums that are important to them. My guest this time is Julia Wolf, a composer based in New York, who started Bang on a Cam, a contemporary classical organisation which she founded alongside David Lang and Michael Gordon. And she composes incredibly intense music, very deep music, music that links in with history, that really plunges into that history as well. As we talk about at the start of this interview, her music these days involves extensive research, interviews, basically being a historian for a bit. And then results in these works of so much colour and diversity and moments of loud, moments of quiet, just really pushing at every extreme. Now there's a BBC4 documentary called Tones, Drones and Arpeggios, The Magic of Minimalism, which is on uh, 2nd of March. So if you're picking this up when it comes out this Friday at 9pm on BBC4, as I've said, And it's where Charles Hazelwood talks with the, I guess, pioneers, as history would call them, of American minimalist classical music. And while it focuses on Terry Riley, Lamont Young, Philip Glass and Steve Reich, there's an ellipsis, really, at the end where it sort of fans out to talk about the work of Bang on a Can and Julia Wolfe in particular as someone who's pushing these ideas forward but really doing so much more than that they're a component to a work which encompasses so much more and expands in every direction as i've said so be sure to check out the documentary on friday and if you want to check out more about julia's work if you can go to uh, juliawolfmusic.com And of course, you can go to attentionmagazine.co.uk forward slash crucial listening for more information on Julia's music and also Julia's picks as well. So it's a briefer crucial listening this time. We had about 40 minutes to get the interview down and it was over the phone as well. But it was a wonderful discussion and I really enjoyed Julia's picks. And it was really great to hear us talk about them as well. I think she's got such an energy when she talks about this kind of music. Okay, without any further delay, here's Julia Wolf on Crucial Listening. Hello, Julia. Welcome to Crucial Listening. Hello. Great to be here. Yeah, great to be there. (laughs) Talking to you. (laughs) Um, So the primary reason I'm talking to you today is, well, firstly, because you've, as all guests do, um, put forward three albums for me to listen to that are important to you. But also as well, um, you're involved in a recent documentary on the BBC, Tones, Drones and Arpeggios and the Magic of Minimalism. And I've seen a couple of documentaries where your music's featured in one of these. And you've been placed in the lineage of, you know, a particular canon of music. I'm aware of the fact as well, though, that you see yourself as a a renegade and I guess someone who pushes back (laughs) as much as they perpetuate. So just I'm intrigued as to how you feel or how you interact with those kind of things where you're, I guess, placed upon a lineage or placed within a line of particular work. I mean, how does that sit with you? Well, it's interesting to, to to have the liberty of calling myself a renegade. I mean, often you're <laughs> usually called that as opposed to calling yourself. But <laughs> I think it's it's, it's more just a, you know, it's a matter of this this kind of spirit of adventure, um, wanting to go somewhere I haven't been before. I'm always challenging myself to um, rethink music, not just be on automatic. Oh yeah, I know how to do that. It's kind of like I don't know how to do that. I, you know, where do I start? And um, 
So that's much more exciting to me than, let's say, you know, refining uh, my craft. You know, I mean, like thinking of it as a refining uh, process. It's more, more exciting for me to think of um, it's going towards what's new. And um, I've always been drawn to music that does that. I think there's a kind of spirit. And I, maybe you're born with that spirit. I'm, I'm really not sure. <laughs> but a kind of spirit in, in, in the music that has really had an impact on me that has to do with, um, in a certain sense, having an experience, a, a new experience. So it's not just about notes and harmony and rhythm. It's it's, it's about what does that what does that piece feel like? What is the experience of being inside a work of music? And so that's that's the starting point. I mean, I think I that's how I I, I think in terms of my relationship to. Um, tradition. I feel very connected to, you know, everyone from Charles Ives to, um, uh, I'm trying to think for all the other, like, particularly American renegades, all the way up to, um, you know, Bryce and Glass, and I mean the, the Meredith Monk. I mean the sort of more current people push that push the boundaries that are still with us and still active as artists. Mm. So um, I identify with that line, particularly the line of, of American composers, and, and certainly there are figures in in the UK and Europe who also fit into that category for me, but um, it's what excites me, really. Yeah, I mean, you talk about there searching for something that lies beyond simply just music on the stage. I mean, what I really like about reading about your work is, I mean, especially recently, the amount of research that goes into it. I mean, clearly there's so much going on um, beneath the surface and beneath just the qualities of the music itself. And I see that actually just recently you did a week-long residency of part of your current or upcoming work, Fire In My Mouth. Um, given that your previous work had like such a long research period of like a year and a half, was it? Yeah, for anthracite fields. Yeah, I, um, a good part of a year. or you know, it, And it's hard to always define what the time frame is because I get the idea. I pick up a book. Maybe I'm working on a different piece, but my mind starts to roll. So it's it's over a kind of undefined period of time. But there's about a year where I'm really like steeped in it, where I, uh, you could say I'm obsessed with mm. the, with the subject, and it doesn't stop. I mean, I'm still really fascinated by the subject um, of coal coal mining in, in Pennsylvania. You know, you think that there's there's a finite finite <laughs> amount of information, but it it, it, it there isn't. It just keeps coming and more stories come my way. So, but I, but, you know, with both Anthracite Fields and then for this new work, Fire in My Mouth, um, it's a wonderful time period when I get to be a kind of historian and um, mm-hmm. it's, it's part of my background and my education as well, but, it, it, but not <laughs> in any professional way. But suddenly I'm interviewing people and I'm reading books and looking at oral histories and looking at maps and other kinds of documents to get closer to the subject, really to try to understand these very, very poignant moments in, you know, particularly in in American labor history. And um, I've always been interested in it. And this has been such an amazing way to learn about it, to, to think, how do I, how do I honor it? And how do I make a portrait that is both historically accurate, but it's also very, very personal. It's not like reading a book about the, the garment industry. Hmm. There are plenty of books on the garment industry. That, you know, I don't need to try to write one. It's not a book. It's it, it's a but it is a kind of history. It's a kind of retelling of a history. So, um, so it's been really fun. Really fun for me. I say fun. Meanwhile, these are very dark subjects. Yeah, of course. So, um, well, although there are some wonderfully, you know, illuminated parts to to these stories, and there, there's a lot of um, tragedy involved. But then there is overcoming tragedy and moving to a, a, a better place. I mean, that's the whole story of labor law. You know, that that hopefully um, we're moving towards a place where people are are treated better, and 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 that. You know, concern, public concern, spurs on activism and action. So, um, so this is something that's very dear to my heart. I got very interested, in it. and it's um, been a really interesting way of working with music. Very, very uh, enriching, really. Yeah, I- I'm intrigued because I've done a project where it's involved copious amounts of research, but then an output at the end of it. 
And I decided to flip the switch halfway and not be a recipient and then suddenly be an outputter. But how has it worked for you in terms of when you're doing the research, are you also creating or do you amass the research and then, you know, switch signals and and, and then suddenly you're transmitting rather than receiving? Yeah, and, and both cases were different. So I'd say um, with anthracite fields, I probably had really a good bulk of the research finished before I started writing music. That, that said, there's still a kind of back and forth between develop because I'm also writing the text, or, or even, I could say in some cases, compiling the text. So I start to color code my notebooks and say, okay, I seem to be having a focus on you know, for example, in, in anthracite fields, on the breaker boys and the boys who worked in the mine. So all of the little bits of information and notes I took, I'll suddenly like say, okay, let's just make a little uh, highlight in red or something. You know, so I, uh, that's that subject. And so these subjects are just the very poignant issues would emerge out, and then I would go, okay, that seems to be a theme in this bigger story. Um, with this piece, I am going more back and forth. It's probably just because of logistics, I have a series of readings, which is such a gift. So I have readings with a couple of university orchestras. And so I have to get this much together to hear the reading. And so <laughs> I still have a good bit of research to do. I'm, I mean, I have a kind of, I've done a lot of reading already, but I have a, an arc for the piece. And um, But I needed to get two movements done so I can actually make good use of the reading. And so it's a little bit more back and forth this time. I still have a, quite a bit of Kind of text development for for fire in my mouth. Um, but although I, I I have the basic movements in mind because um, that that could change, <laughs> but <laughs> but basic movements in mind because of the I have a, I think I have a pretty good handle at this point of of what I want to tell, um, what what I hope to tell in that in that story. Fantastic. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing that come together. Um, Sounds like I've got a little while to wait yet. Um, But yeah, good luck with all of that. I'll move now to uh, the reason, I guess, that we're talking today, which is the three albums that you've put forward as important records to you. What I like to ask people when they come on the show is the criteria by which you thought about the term important. I mean, it has so many different ways of, you know, that you could slice it. So how did it work for you? What was the term important like for you? Well, you, first of all, it's very hard to, to ask a music lover, like, what's your favorite, <laughs> your favorite piece? I mean, I got, there, are, there are so many. I mean, I, you know, I, it is possible to, be, to make choices, which is what I did. But in a certain sense, it's, it's interesting to think about, well, what, what was important to me, because there are very different pieces that were important to me for different reasons. So um, I made this decision to focus on pieces that are more recent because I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. What's affecting me right now? Um, mm. When I, when I started, certainly, um, Bryce's Jay Lee, Glasses, Einstein on the Beach, Meredith Monk's Dolman Music. I mean, these were okay, among many other works, but the, uh, Andreessen's De Stott, these, these were pieces that rocked my world. And, but I thought, um, there's, everybody knows these pieces and they, and I, it, I thought it might be interesting in this context to think about, um, who are my peers? You know, who is part of a next generation coming up? Who I think are, are really contributing something magical, and beautiful to, to the world of music. So I decided on two composers who are my peers, um, and one composer who is, um, you know, a skip younger. Uh, all doing very, very um, powerful work. If you'd like to pick uh, the first. Of your choices, I'll let you choose whichever one you want to go with first, and then tell me a bit about why it's important as well. Well, I can start with Become Ocean. It's a beautiful, large-scale orchestra work um, by John Luther Adams, and it's very daring um, (laughs) what he's done. He's written this kind of glacial, um, experiential piece for symphony orchestra, and I'm not saying this has never been done before, but the way he's done it certainly hasn't been done before, but he's bringing this a very different aesthetic 
to um, to a very established context, and that's very exciting to me to to try to change up the world and so it's clear he's thinking about the fact that there are a hundred people or over a hundred people on stage. What kind of massive sound um, if he's I'm, I'm speaking for him can I create I'm guessing he thought that and um and when you're listening to it, it's really on um, recording. It was recorded by the Seattle, Seattle Symphony. You um, put those headphones on and just <laughs> absorb. You can't really listen the way you listen to um, something where you're kind of concentrating. It's much more about how does that music get inside of you. And um, it has these large, slow, I guess, like kind of glacial waves of sound. Um, very carefully, the architecture of that is very carefully created or built, I guess I'd say. So it was a remarkable piece. I think he's coming from a very different place than that's a standard orchestral repertoire. Um, he thinks a lot about environmental issues and I think, you know, who he is as a person also is kind of what helps it impact that work. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned there about the quite specific listening experience that you get with this record. I had it on and my lounge there's a surround sound system in there almost felt like the room oh, wow. itself was filling up with water just the way that everything's <laughs> dispersed it's really gorgeous but um and he he is thinking spatially as mm. well so that's i think that is um another extension so a surround sound i bet would be the best either surround sound or actually sitting on the stage in the middle of the orchestra <laughs> i would think it would be the two ideal ways of hearing that piece yeah because I've seen him talk about um, that as a listener, um, the ideal is to be in the middle of that orchestra. And I do get the sense as well that, to me, that he's almost aiming for this breaking of the division, I guess, between listener and piece, and the fact that it's called Become Ocean. I mean, I don't know if that's something that right. you well, feel when you're listening I'm, to it. Yeah, and that, that is an interesting idea that the title is telling us something because become that means we are supposed to are we supposed to become something and in the process of experiencing the peace become ocean um it's obviously i think also his connection to nature wanting to be a part of one with nature a part of the nature he loves mm. um but i think he's he's welcoming us i think you're right he is welcoming us in to um, ex- experiencing the music yeah, from the inside and um, as opposed to, let's say, um, bringing something that's flashy or, or impressive, which I think it, it is impressive, but it's not, it, its aim doesn't seem to be impressive. It, its aim is very ambitious, but it's a kind of welcoming in. I, I th- I, that's how I experience it. Yeah. Do you remember when you first heard it? Oh, I know where I first heard it live um, uh, at Carnegie Hall. The oh, um, wow. Seattle Symphony came to Carnegie Hall to play. I took, I took a huge number of students to go here, which is really hard to organize. <laughs> you know, I because I'm, I'm currently teaching at, at New York University, and um, I said, "You guys have to hear this. You know, we, we have to go." So hmm. it was like you know the Pied Piper, you know me with like, the <laughs> of, of young composers um, filling the upper reaches of Carnegie Hall. You know we didn't get fancy seats; we're like way up, which is actually a great place to sit because the sound is very good, um, and you can see everything. You can look down and see what exactly is going on, as opposed to front row. Um, so that's the first. That's I, that's the first time I heard it live, and the only time I've heard it live, I guess, actually. Um, yeah, but I mean, I've, I've subsequently heard you know the recording, and I mean, been loving the recording, and um, and um, we also got the opportunity to be co-producers of the CD. So we put out um, the recording made by the Seattle Symphony with our little mom and pop label, Candlelit Music. So that was really exciting to to be part of its, you know, birth and coming into the world so anybody anywhere can hear it. And, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, yeah, it's been a very kind of seminal piece, I think, for a lot of us, certainly for the younger generation as well.
you'd like to tell me your second important album, Julia, and uh, why it's important to you as well? Um, sure. I mean, this isn't in any particular order, but maybe for a, a dramatic contrast. I should just say the other two works are both vocal works, um, choral works. One is a small mm. group of four singers, and the other is a, for eight singers. Um, so I could talk about Partita for Eight Voices next. Um, that is uh, written by Carolyn Shaw. She's a, a young American composer and um also, she's in the group singing, so she's a part of Room Full of Teeth. That's the name of the, the choir she's a part of. Um, she's a violinist, uh, she's a multi-talented artist, and um, just just fabulous. I think it really rocked the choral world, rocked everyone's world when she you know, gave birth to that piece. And um, it's just a remarkable use of voice. I think that... Um, it shows what, first of all, what the voice can do. And it's not about gymnastics. It's not like, let's say, extended technique for, in the modernist sense. Mm. It's really about drawing on different vocal techniques from different traditions. Um, her just experimenting with her own voice. And um, one thing I love about it is it, it captures a certain kind of intimacy with these very kind of intimate, growly sort of sound. And then uh, we'll get very, very gradually, we'll transform into something massive. So you may start with a kind of back of the throat scratchiness, and out comes this lush, rich chord um, out of these eight voices. And how did she get from one place to the other? I, I don't know. She just <laughs> finds these ways of transforming sound and choral sound in a way that no one no one has done before. And I think this has really affected everyone. Everyone's listening. It's to the choral world. I think the choral world is so hot right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, if you said to a composer a few years back, oh, you know, would you like to write for chorus? I go, chorus <laughs> and it may be single voices you know like for all because all those beautiful pieces by Reich and Andreessen for example mm. they they use individual singers they don't want a chorus because a chorus has this kind of old timey feeling well chorus is no longer old timey it is now the it the it project for, for composers <laughs> and there are these amazing choruses and certainly it's even like nearby the crossing trinity wall street um L.A. Masters Chorale, they're all, I mean, they've all, you know, at different lengths of how long they've been in existence, but but they're all pushing the boundaries, welcoming in all kinds of new ideas. And I think Carolyn's piece really is a part of that wave, and she's um, she's done something remarkably beautiful. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about that piece. I think that it's a piece also that, that, Inspired is inspiring a whole new generation of composers. You can hear it in, in the work that's coming out. So um, that's one of my favorites. Mm, for yeah. Sure. And am I right in thinking that you've worked with Carolyn as well yourself? Was it on Shelter? Um, yeah, yeah. She, um, she's. I, you know, that's kind of how I first met her. I just knew her as uh, one of the three singers in, the, in mm-hmm. this uh, piece for a trio of female voices and um, large ensemble. And that's a work that was created by me, Michael Gordon, and David Lang. So we're, the three of us are the founders, artistic founders of Bang on a Can. And we've done a number of projects as a, as a triumvirate. Um, and, one, and one of those projects, we were looking for, you know, that kind of pure, natural singing voice, not too, no vibrato, just um, more early music kind of sound. And Carolyn, along with uh, her colleagues, seemed like a perfect match for us. So we so we worked together in that way and then since then we've become really good, close colleagues, just um to mutual admiration society oh, wow. um which follow following her work and um you know, just a really nice dialogue since then. But but we worked together and I think we probably worked together in other countries as well. And she's also an excellent violinist, so she's gigging, um, performing as well as as writing, doing a lot of writing for herself as well. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's fun here in New York. It's a lot <laughs> going on. And, 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 and wonderful, this kind of multi-generational crossing over is very, very rich right now. I mean, that I'm dialoguing with Carolyn, you know, I'm dialoguing with Steve Rice, you know, this is all here in the city and these kind of very, um, personal connections is, is amazing. I don't, 
think I could have even imagined that. I think that it's a very different world now, the world of new music and new ideas of music than it was when I first came into the field. And part of that change is this wonderful kind of sharing of ideas. And um, so there's a little less of a, a distance or a battleground or whatever, whatever it was before. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a very good time right now. Yeah. And speaking of which, I mean, I've seen you speak about the boundary or the desire, I guess, to perish it that exists between classical music and music outside of classical music, I guess. I mean, I have yeah. I see with um, Carolyn, obviously she's worked with Kanye. Um, and I also yes, saw like yes. Taylor Swift donated $50,000 to the Seattle Symphony after hearing... Oh, you're right. Yeah, like John Lee for Adam's work. Become ocean. Yeah, yeah, remarkable, really remarkable, and that's that's exciting. I mean, the, there shouldn't be um, any barriers or walls. I think that you know we're all listening to pop music, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that they're now listening across across the ocean, to, you know, just to hear <laughs> this other world of music. But how do we impact each other, and how do we influence each other? And I think that that those crossing overs are very exciting. I think just for all kinds of reasons, but I, I, I guess true, particularly with those two works, um, or those two composers. Also true for David Lang, who's the third person I picked in, who's my longtime colleague at Bang in the Can. Um, he's writing, working in the film world as well now, and and I think recently, I can't remember which band it was, but uh, there was a band that that licensed his piece, um, Just. And so suddenly in this rock band, you're hearing Oh wait, there's there's David Lyons music <laughs> as a part of their remix, they're part of their world, and um, so it, yeah, it's much more. There's much more crossing over going on now, very naturally crossing over. And one more question I had related to Carolyn's work as well is that I saw that her score uses a number of interesting phrases to try and articulate what her intention, I suppose. So like floaty head voices something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued as Great. what's your relationship with something like that, trying to project your intention onto performers? Um, how do you find that experience? Oh, it's interesting because last time I was at this wonderful coaching session for a piece and um, so percussion was actually coaching uh, some students playing this, this uh, percussion quartet I have called Dark Full Ride. And it was amazing to watch them coach and, and the way they use language. They they made a lot of references to it's a piece for four drum sets, so they were making a lot of references to rock drummers like like Bonham and um you know, other other sort of greats in the in the drum set world. And um I think partly you know, communicating that this kind of concert music does not need to be restrained. Um it's physical, music is physical, let it be physical, and um, so this is something I think about a lot. And so in, in the score, um, there's some, mostly it's it's pretty notated, but there are some, at times, more open ways of, that I notate. Um, I use a lot of language, just English, you know, on top of the, the staff, and I'll say, um, you know, dig deep, get gritty, um, <laughs> drive you know, I, and sometimes I get kind of goofy with it. And, it, and it's funny because if you're working with a group, like let, let's say in Germany, they go, what do you mean by groove here? <laughs> what do you mean by, you know, and I like, it, I sometimes have to translate a little bit, but I think that they also just enjoy that I'm trying to communicate um, a little bit off the page and by being I guess, somewhat poetic or um, expressive in, in the language I use to talk about how music is made. Music is not a piece of paper with some dots on it. It's it's a physical, emotional expression. So to help communicate that to the player and whatever it takes gets it out of that, um, you know, idea of we're, we're aiming for perfection. Yes, I do want you to play these notes in that rhythm, mm. but not like in a square way and not like in a, in a constrained way. I want you to just fly with it. And so how to you know sometimes it helps with a recording you'll hear the recording oh that's that's how they do it you know but if you don't have that or there isn't a recording yet then just trying to communicate it on the page i'll do that when i do it in person but um try to get it into the score whenever it makes sense also <laughs>
Well, if we could have your final pick, Julia, and a little bit about why that one's important as well. Yeah, um, a little magical passion hit the scene and went running. Um, <laughs> it's, I think it's played all over the world now. It's had certain almost ritualistic performances that are done annually at, at holiday time. It's it's kind of the new music you know, version of, of of a carol, like a, a big hit <laughs> Christmas carol. Um, I don't know that David meant it that way, but and it's it's uh, I think it's had such a big impact because um it feels it's very, very beautiful. Also, you know, working with the voice in a different way. But I think in particular it's working with with storytelling in a different way, which I think is um very interesting for music to to confront and deal with it. You, know, you can tell a story in an opera by people standing and belting out <laughs> <laughs> high notes, <laughs> or you can make this for a more intimate setting. The David has his he has four singers, and they're all also playing small bits of percussion as part of the piece. Um, but they're they're telling the story, and it's it's both linear in the sense that he has this thread of a story going through, but then he's interrupting it with these sort of more exclamatory moments mm. where it's not linear anymore. We're just exclaiming. Um, <laughs> and I mean, the piece is sort of complex, how he kind of developed it and laid it out, but it's basically a back and forth between this very painful, sad story about little match girl, um, which is the Hans Christian Andersen story. And then tying into some of the text from St. Matthew's Passion, he doesn't refer to Jesus. He's taken Jesus out, but he's yes. he's trying to uh, just deal with the chorus, you know. And it's, it's very emotional when they say "Come, daughter, come." Mm. He's putting that back to back with um, the, like the more linear story of the little match girl, and so um, it's, it's pretty brilliant. I think fusing of worlds in terms of the text, and um, and then using very beautiful vocal techniques of kind of almost echoey sounds and um, like almost like reverb, and very economical. I mean, just like I said, four singers, and then they have to use their hands <laughs> and feed as well <laughs> in, the, in the percussion parts. So it's um, yeah, really um, very very magical piece. And I've been working with David for gosh over thirty years, and. It, it's just a long, rich friendship. I mean, I think that's true for, for the three of us, for Michael Gordon, Dave Lang, and I. We just we were kids together. We landed in New York City in our in our twenties, and um, really kind of built a life together. And and the kind of what we think of as a little uto- utopia in, in our bang in, the, bang in the can world. So, you know, and certainly uh, people like Steve Reich and Philip Glass, uh, who you know formed their own musicians, blazed the trail. They so you can do it yourself. You can find your own way and not have to fit into existing institutions or existing um, ensembles. And so we we took that to heart. And um, and David has had this huge impact really on my thinking. You know, just thinking about music, old music and new music actually. Mm-hmm. So I feel I feel really very blessed to have that that kind of friendship. I mean, actually for all these three people, I've developed friendships with them. Um, but particularly with David, it's just a long, long time collaborator, partner in trouble, as I sometimes <laughs> say <laughs> for us, little partners in trouble. So it's, uh, yeah, very, very special. Fantastic. One last question for you, actually, with this one. Yeah. I'm intrigued because you work well, uh, so you work closely with David. I mean, how much insight were you getting into the creation of this piece? I, I don't know how that works with you guys. I mean, does he just emerge with something or do you get a, a window into it? Yeah, I can reveal some secrets. We actually have certain <laughs> moments, all of us, Michael, David and I, where we can point to the fact that we had a conversation about this moment and it changed the, it changed the moment in the piece. Uh, yeah, we all are very independent, like sort of doing our own thing. But there are moments, I, I can think of a moment where David gave me feedback and I change the ending of a piece or kind of lengthen the ending of a piece. Um, so in Little Match Girl, he, he did play some of this for me. And what we do is we actually hold the phone up to the speakers. And like, Listen to this. What do you think? How's it, we, you know, and, I, and so he did that. He held the phone up to the speakers. And he had this wonderful section where he was doing this sort of rapidly repeating um Rapidly repeating phrase like um, like come 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 you know like that kind yeah. of uh, sound, and I was like, you did that once. That sounds so good, and you're doing it <laughs> once. No, no, no. You have to do that again. That's like 
<laughs> it's just beautiful. It goes so beautifully with your piece. So he did it. <laughs> he did it again. So uh, I don't know if that's something I should be revealing, but, but that was my only tiny contribution. But I just said, great, do it again. Um, so, but we do have these great, great conversations. And um, somewhere with, with Michael, he's, I'm often going in and listening to his work, and, and he's coming in and uh, constantly saying, yeah, what do you think? How's this? How, what's your take on this? Um, and certainly between the two of them. So, so it's, it, it's it's a great way to work. I mean, I really like not being in total isolation and having that opportunity to, to have an exchange. And, um, you know, in the end, you have to make your own decisions, but, but to have this kind of constant um, openness to, to other people's perspective, um, for me, it's, 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 it's I loved it. I, you know, I would do it. I would do it every day if I. But, but everybody's busy, so I can't do it every day. So, um, but certainly, a very important part of my own creative creative process. And that I should say that process also is true for how I work with the Bang in the Can All Stars. So that it's like my home band um, or our home band, really. So it's not just with my you know my peers um, uh, in in the composer side of it, but also. That dialogue with the performers is amazing to have that. You don't always get that when you're you know, commissioned and then you hand the piece. And for me, it's the, the workshopping part of it and the development of a piece is um, much enriched by, by the players I'm, I'm working with. Run away with it. Saying that he could use it as a cradle when he had children of his own. So the little girl. Went out with her little naked feet, which were quite red and blue with the cold. So the little well, Julia, speaking of everyone being busy, I understand that we're yes, against the clock. Yes, I see the this is the magic here. hour. It turns 5 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> we're heading out the door. <laughs> oh, well, I'm so happy we got in. This is great. And, and thank you so much for inviting me to sound like rushed or something. But um, no, yeah, no. I can just say. Not at all. An <laughs> absolute pleasure. <laughs> okay, thanks so much.